Okay, welcome back. Um, we're finally going to wrap up book two of Plato's Republic today. <clears throat> we're we're just in the last section, the last few pages. Um, Socrates and uh, Adamantus have um, basically just got to the point where they say that they need to specify what would be the appropriate kinds of stories for poets to tell in a city that would um, educate people to be good guardians. Uh, so we got up to basically 379A. So we're just going to, the mm -hmm. thing I want to do is just go through the last little bit of book two, which is um, <clears throat> when Socrates and Adamantus start talking then about what would be uh, the correct things for the poets to say. Um, and that's a theme then that's going to get pursued further in book three. But, just, but the first thing I want to do is just get through these last parts of book two. And there, there are really two points here um, that have to do with the correct way to portray the gods. Um, and they're going to associate them with two laws that they're going to make. Um, so anyway, um, and, you know, I've been trying to stress how, how far this conversation is from a simple presentation of, of you know, Socrates' doctrine you know, or something like that. Right? I've been trying to draw your attention to the conversational dynamics, to the errors that are made, etc., etc., etc. And that's... That's, that's just going to continue here uh, in a pretty striking way. Um, so here, as in anywhere, you need to remember what you know about Socrates while you're reading this. And then if, if, you, if you hold on to that, then I think you can see it's pretty big distance between the things that Adamantus ends up being responsible for uh, establishing and the things that Socrates thinks. Oh, I'm just going to shut this window. Um, so as he said, uh, at 479A, um, we're going we're gonna to have to specify what stories the poet should tell. What, what, yeah, yeah. So that's correct, Adamantus said. But that's just it. What would the models for speech about the gods be? Right? Uh, that's, that's what they want to know. Um, and Socrates says, well, surely something like this. The God must surely always be described such as he is, whether one presents him in epics, lyrics, or tragedies. And then, actually, let's read the next one together with that, because it matters. Adamantus says, yes. And then Socrates says, then is the God really good? And hence, must he be said to be so? Adamantus says, of course. So, the, the God, you know, the ultimate thing we're going to talk about is going to be good going to be the good right the god is going to be purely good that that's 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 the the sort of um that's the key that this thing is going to revolve around and that's fine um socrates this the republic is end up is going to end up revolving around the notion of the good um and so the first time you read this through you wouldn't know what's going to be said there but after you have read it you do know what's going to be said there so that's a pretty important thing to keep in mind when you're reading these passages because basically everything that is affirmed here about God as the good is going to contradict what Socrates is going to very explicitly affirm at the center of the book. Um, so the very fir first one right here, right? Must this God be said to be this God who is the good, who is, who is pure goodness? Uh, well, Socrates is going to say that the good is beyond being, epikena te um, And in general, that when you're talking about the good, it's more like you have to talk, use the language of is not rather than is. Now, I'm not going to get into that here and probably not at all. Um, it's a great topic, but it's a, it's a little beyond what we're after right now. Uh, just as an interesting aside, like it's worth remembering that Parmenides was emphasizing, you know, is, is, and is not, is, is not. And you can talk about is, you can't talk about is not, and so on. Um, well, in a significant, and, and I said before that, you know, Socrates, in a way, is contributing to that sort of story I was marking out in the pre-Socratic philosophers and saying what he's contributing is, is thinking of the ultimate nature of reality in terms of the good. That's the same thing we're going to see in the Republic. But it's interesting that when he does that, there's a significant way in which he's going to insist on a, a meaningful use of the notion of is not. For talking about the good rather than the notion of is 
Now, at some level, that should just sound like nonsense when you hear it now, just because because you haven't heard it explained, you don't know what's really meant by that. And I don't want to explain it. So we'll just have to leave it as an idea for the future. But my point simply is he's going to affirm that. And so in a significant way, the thing he's going to affirm maybe actually counts as a meaningful uh, difference from the sort of thing Parmenides is saying. So that, that would be something worth thinking about at some point. But um, uh, or a change in the sense of what that is. Um, but we'll leave it there for now. All I want you to know is that when Socrates is really going to get a, to, around to talking about the good serious, you know, on his own terms, um, he's basically going to deny the language of being for it. So when they say here, so the God then uh, must surely be described such as he is. Mm -mm. That'd be the wrong way to talk about it. Um, and, um, and so that is... Is the God really good and he hence must it be said to be so? Mm -mm. Right? Th those things that Adamantus agrees to seriously here are things that, that are counter to what Socrates is ultimately going to affirm. affirm. So that's, what, that's the first thing for you to recognize. Like I said, you don't know that yet because you haven't read through the book. So you, there's no reason you should know that now unless you happen to know other things about Socrates. But I'm letting you know that for the, because we, you know, we're trying to make something out of this study. So I want you just to see some of the problems in the conversation here. Um, but then the next one. So then, and Socrates says, "Well, but none of the good things is harmful, is it?" And Adamantus says, "Not in my opinion." Well, that's too bad because the central thing Socrates is going to say about good things, when, we, when which we will talk about uh, in Book Five and Book Six, is that every good thing is harmful. Um, that that's you can't you can't have a good thing that's purely good, and that's going to be actually one of the most powerful parts of his study in Book Six. He's going to be talking about you know the development of your own soul, and he's going to talk about why it is that some things that on their own are are profoundly good, at least in terms of the potential they offer, can actually destroy your life if you have them. The, the things that could that that are that are good things. Uh, nonetheless, put in the wrong context are a disaster. <coughs> so, I mean, and we've already seen that. Just think about these other things. Medicine, is it a good thing? Yeah. Could it be harmful? Yeah, you can kill people with it. Um, uh, guardians, could they be harmful? Yeah, they guard the city. Could they be harmful? Yeah, they could take over the city and, and kill you. Uh, the, the whole thing we've already been looking at, where the, one of the big themes I've been stressing is that ambivalence of these things we develop, right? That that's what we have to deal with. And Socrates is going to make that point very explicit later. But but so here he says that, you know, will a good can a good thing be harmful? Well, the answer unequivocally, based on the things we've seen and the things Socrates says, is yes. Adimantus answer? No. And so he said he says, uh, okay, well, can that which isn't harmful, can it do harm? No. Right? Um can that which is, does not harm do evil? No. Can that which doesn't do evil be the cause of evil? No. Uh, but is the good beneficial? Yes. So is it the cause of doing well? Yes. And so sorry, he says, okay, then is, is this what we should conclude? That the good is not the cause of everything. It's only the cause of the good things, not the cause of the bad things. Um, and uh, Adam says, yes, that's entirely so. Well, too bad, right? The whole point of Socrates' discussion is going to be the opposite, right? That the good is the cause of everything. He says that very explicitly in another dialogue in the Phaedo, somewhere around 99b or something. He's, he says, you know, that's his guiding idea that um, uh, that that everything in a way <clears throat> is caused by the good. He's going to say that again here in, in Book 6. So, so the whole thing that is happening in this conversation, because of Adamantus's answers, is that he Adamantus is developing a, an interpretation of what the gods are or what God is, and that is that he is a uh, he is good and he does good things, which means he can't ever ever do anything that would cause any harm, uh, and bad things in the world happen for a different reason, right? Quite the opposite of what Socrates' view is ultimately going to be. But so then he says, okay, well, let's look look at the poets from that point of view. Um, it's interesting. We're going to look at the poets, and you're going to see that the very quickly he's going to show you that Homer says the opposite. So uh, to Adiamantus, uh, that seems like a reason to think, oh, yeah, we should ditch that stuff. 
to, uh, but maybe what we should see is the opposite. Maybe we should see that that poetry has been telling us profound things about the nature of reality. Um, and in as much as we're going to, Adamantus is going to get rid of it because it's actually going to be poetically presenting the very thing that Socrates is going to argue for philosophically in this book. And then maybe that should make you then think about what is it that really goes on in those poets? And that might have something to do with the wisdom that, uh, that Socrates was looking for when he talked about the poets, talked with the poets in the Apology. But anyway, he says, okay, so he says, all right then, this is now, we're now at uh, the very end of 379C, right before D, he says, well then, I said, we mustn't accept Homer's or any other poets foolishly making that mistake about the gods, right, where they say that gods might cause good and evil both, right? So he, then he quotes, he says, two jars stood on Zeus's threshold, full of dooms, the one of good, the other of wretched, and the man to whom Zeus gives a mixture of both, at one time he happens on evil, another good, etc., etc. Um, nor that Zeus is the dispenser to us of good and evil alike. Right? So, yeah, we have this, the, these sort of myth, mythical stories that describe, like, God has these two things, the good and the evil, and he makes them both available. And uh, we partake of those things and so what we get is a world where sometimes we're good sometimes we're bad something like that but that comes from you know the nature of whatever that ultimate thing is that's responsible for reality and so on um that that's sound that's homer affirming all the things that adamantus wants to deny right? so at 380b they say um so, as for the assertion that a god who is good is the cause of evil to anyone, we must make great exertions against anyone saying that in our city, right? If, if our laws are going to be well observed. And, and Adamantus says uh, at 380C, I give my vote to you in support of this law. Right? So, I mean, they're not really making a city, but, it, but obviously, but they're like saying this is this then I guess is going to be the first law of our constitution that the God has to be portrayed as good, as the good, and, the, and therefore not as the cause of anything evil, not as responsible for anything evil. Um, so, uh, you know, there's something kind of interesting there. Like, so what, the one thing that Socrates is pursuing throughout this, the very first thing he aims at, and the theme that keeps running through this, is the identification of God with the good. And that is actually going to be, he's going to stick with that. So, so we are being brought into touch with the, the, the thing we ultimately need to hold on to. But our grappling with what, what that would mean starts off at the wrong end, right? So we, we start here saying things that, that maybe, like they sound sensible to Adamantus, maybe they sound sensible to you too. They should, um, I think, they, they, because they're, they're, they're sort of plausible that good things don't, aren't, don't harm, do they? Um, though I don't think it takes too much uh, reflection to see the problem with that. There's a sort of immediate way when you, where you would kind of think that's right. Um, but so with Adamantus, we, we really get... Um, something that on the surface is, you know, has some intuitive appeal, and it may be the place where many people start. Um, uh, and in in our efforts to think about the good, and this book is going to force us to think about that a bit, but it's the opposite of where we're going to end up. Let me add one more word there. Cause is, a, is, a, is also a complicated word. And um, so when he says that, um, you know, when he asks, can a good thing ever be harmful? The answer is yes. But that's a little bit different from saying that good thing is the cause of of harm. You know, uh, can can uh, can medic can can the development of medicine be the co uh, result in harm? Yeah, because people can use that for bad ends. Um, is it medicine that's the cause of that? Maybe not. You know, it's like it's like a weapon. Um, it can be used to kill someone, but the thing that the weapon by itself didn't kill the. Do, commit an unjust killing 
and the knowledge, the medical knowledge by itself didn't do harm, though it it was uh, a dangerous power. But someone had to use it for for evil purposes. Um, so uh, it can be an instrument of evil, but maybe it doesn't cause evil exactly. So 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 it may well be that Socrates could endorse this claim that the good is not the cause of evil in, in some important sense of the word cause. Nonetheless, the good is the cause of everything in the sense that it's it's ultimately going to be the, th- uh, the thing you have to expl- appeal to to explain to, uh, to explain all the things that happen, good and bad alike. So there's a sense in which it's the cause, but maybe not in the... Uh, well, let me just let me just say there may be some senses in which it is, and some senses in which it isn't. Um, anyway, we don't we don't need to pursue that now. I just I just want to to get you to notice here that this first law um, uh, there probably there probably is a sense in which Socrates could endorse it, but not the sense in which Adamantus is is going to take it up or has already taken it up. But anyway. Um, So I said, so Socrates says, I said, this will be one of the laws and models concerning the gods, according to which those who produce speeches will will have to do their speaking, right? Uh, And then he says, okay, what about a second law? And this one now is about how the god appears. And Socrates says, do you suppose that the god is a wizard, able treacherously to reveal himself at different times in in different visions, different ways, different looks, uh, different ways of being seen? At one time, actually himself changing and passing from his own form into many shapes. At another time, deceiving us and making such, uh, think such things about him. Or is he simple and does he least of all, of all things, depart from his own proper uh, form? Uh, and Adam says, well, on the spur of the moment, I can't say. Um, and so then Socrates is going to explain. And, and he's, Adam Antis isn't going to end up agreeing that he can't change. Um, and that's going to be their second law, more or less, right? And it's a little more specific than that, and we'll get to it. But, but again, I want you to think about this issue. Um, again, that's the opposite of what Socrates is going to say. He's he's going to say, on the contrary, that the good always appears in different forms. Um, but so let's look at, and you you will be able to make sense of that almost immediately. Look at the thing they say after that. Socrates is going to explain some things to Adamantus, and he says. Uh, are things that are in the best condition least altered and moved by something else? For example, a body, you know, when it's in a good condition, a healthy condition, the body least moved by food and drink and labor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and, and the, so they're, they were looking at sort of a physical health. And then he says, and, and similarly with the soul, if it's co- courageous and, and prudent or wise, isn't it when it's going to be least sort of affected by things from outside? Uh yeah, let's stick with those two for a second. Uh, I mean, there's, there seems like that seems sort of right, that if you have a strong, healthy body, uh, the things that happen to you, like, you know, eating, you can eat some potato chips and you're still going to be healthy. You can eat some spinach and you're still going to be healthy, you know. Uh, you can fall and hit your head and you're still going to be healthy. Like, you can, you can uh, go through a lot without really uh, suffering change because your, your body, when it's healthy, has a strong sort of... Um, uh, internal uh, strength that, that where it holds on to its its own norm of proper functioning and so on. Uh, it's you know on the other hand when you're sick when that is really weakened you're very vulnerable to things and and things that otherwise you just brush off or nothing can can wipe you out because you don't have that kind of integrity. It's kind of what sickness means. So that seems like a good point. Uh, then he says the same thing about the soul. You know if you're prudent or if you're courageous and prudent, isn't that also going to be the case? The reason I wanted to mention that second example as well uh, makes the same point, and it's right for the same reasons, but it helps you notice something else. If you think, what's a, what, does, what is a prudent person like? You know, someone who, who makes good, good judgment about how to deal with practical situations. Well, you know, sometimes that person might speak up. Sometimes they might hold their tongue. Sometimes they might slip out of the room unnoticed. Sometimes they might make a point of stepping forward and making their presence felt. Sometimes they, you know, I just keep giving examples of the same kind of thing, but sometimes they might voice their opinion, sometimes they might not. Um, Sometimes they might decide 
to go shopping and sometimes they might not, right? So the thing about prudence is you don't just follow a simple rule that says always speak up, always make your opinion known, uh, always go to the store. No, prudence is precisely about knowing how to do different things on different occasions depending on the changing circumstances. So yes, the prudent person or the, the courageous person or whatever it is, is the person who's most able to maintain his or her, their path and disposition in difficult and changing circumstances. So yes, this is a thing that simply holds its own course, like the healthy body. But what, is, what, what, does that, what does that look like? It means that thing takes constantly changing forms in different circumstances. So the, when you look at the, the, the sort of integrity of the soul there, what you see is something that stays the same precisely by appearing differently on different occasions. Um, so, um, so he says, okay, we want something that's going to stay the same as itself. We don't want something that appears differently on different occasions. Yeah, too bad. Those two are the same thing. You can't say, I want this one, but not that. In the very example he gives of courage and prudence is, is essentially the one that shows, uh, you get this by having this, right? So Sagari says, hence, everything that's in fine condition, this is at 381, uh, right where B comes up. Everything in fine condition, whether by nature or art or both, admits little transformation by anything else. Well, yeah, that's right. The prudent or the courageous person isn't being changed by something else. It's holding its own course. But that also means it's constantly changing the form in which it appears. Um so he, so, there, so he says, so if the God is most like that, then he least of all will have many shapes. Actually, probably if anything, this principle means the God more than anything else will, will have the most shapes. It would be the thing that appears in the most varied ways, I would imagine. Uh, but but Adam says, no, that's right. It's just going to be always exactly the same, never going to appear differently. So then he says, would, it, uh, would a God ever want to deceive us? Um, uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to get exactly into that issue too quickly, especially because it sort of comes up because of the way they've handled this conversation. But 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 let's put it this way: would it, would would the God ever have a reason for speaking in riddling speech? Right? Would the God ever have a reason for speaking in ways other than direct, truthful discourse? Remember, he said before, speech is either true or false. Right? So shouldn't the God just speak truly? Well, uh, I guess I should speak to you that way. I'm just a person talking to another person. But if if the God really is the good, or let's even just think of prudence, right? Prudence, prudence can't tell you always speak up or always be quiet. It, prudence can only tell you, you know, do the right thing in the right situation, right? Um, so, you know, how how might you express that, like, um, or? Um, I, I don't have, I don't quite have the right aphorism, but if you remember Heraclitus saying, you know, eyes and ears are bad witnesses to those with barbarian souls. Um, there, you can look at a very simple level to see if that's a factually correct statement or something like that. Uh, but that's not quite how that sentence really works, right? It's more like a, a pithy little saying that, it gives you in a, this kind of concentrated poetic form an idea you can grasp and sort of that you could then cash out in in much more fully in all kinds of more specific ways so like that aphorist or or when he says um he, this isn't quite what he says but i'm going to put it in a slightly form you know uh well no let's take the one even the posset will settle if if it's not stirred that there is one um yeah, it's a claim about the posset, but who cares about a posset? You know, the, but the, but in saying that thing, he's kind of talked with you about a kind of a unity, right? But those are sort of riddling, riddling remarks. And Heraclitus was was called uh, Heraclitus the obscure, the enigmatic, the dark. Uh, this guy who spoke in riddles, and we looked at some of those. Right? Nature loves to hide. Um, um, uh, 
Like, of course, that's a riddle because nature can't hide. Nature, nature is not a little child going behind a tree. Nature is just right there. So what could it mean to say nature loves to hide? Well, you can make sense of that. And we did. But you don't make sense of it by treating it as, as a sentence on par with, oh, it's just started raining. I better get my coat. Right. It's not the kind of sentence that purports to be like picking out little facts in the situation around you where you can go check them against that. It's not it's not that it's more like uh, I mean, it certainly says something and sen- says something real and powerful about the world. But it really says something that's 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 has the effect of changing your perspective on it, forcing you to reorient the way you think about things and and really changing the very terms in which you assess what's going on around you. So it's uh, in a way, therefore, it couldn't be evaluated by that simple matter of seeing if it corresponds to the stuff that's around there, since it's challenging the very terms in which you do do those kinds of measurings. So similarly, you can imagine the gods saying something like, I don't know, no one is wiser than Socrates. Um, and maybe that's factually correct, maybe it's not, but the thing that's more potent about it is that it's a riddling utterance. It's not clear how you could make that fit. And and Socrates' whole life is the attempt to make sense of that. And he says, that was the God speaking to me. And you can see the sense of that. The God didn't say, go out and do this and do that, and then do this and do that. It just said, no one is wiser than Socrates. Yet in that, in and through that riddling utterance, um, a whole life was articulated, but but so, it, it was up to that life, it was up to Socrates to cash his life, or to make his life the cashing out of the interpretation of that thing. Um, you know, think about uh, Proverbs, the beginning of Proverbs. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, something like that. You know, what does that mean? And it, once again, I, I'm not I'm not sure that that's a true false claim like some other claims right it's a it's a piece of wisdom and it's a it is in a way a kind of riddling a riddling remark that you have to think about and it it's its meaning is that you have to change the way you experience the world around you um and you could take it up in a very flat-footed, prosaic way and say, oh, I don't think I should have to fear God, or I don't even believe in God, or, uh, well, I know wise, wise people, and it didn't start there. How could fear of the Lord be the beginning of wisdom? Because you had to be born first, and so you would have to begin somewhere else. So you can say all those things. Um, and those claims may all be factually true, but they just stand out as the things someone would say who didn't have the faintest idea what was being said to them in that remark. Um, uh, so it makes sense that people speak to each other in their daily affairs in prosaic sentences that can be true or false but I I can think of pretty good reasons for thinking that so to speak God speaks in riddles uh, like the Delphic Oracle or like the book of Proverbs or if you don't happen to like the word God, you could say the good speaks in riddles. Um, and so the very nature of those things is that they're, they're, they have the potential to be a bit deceptive. Uh, they're, they're not things you can just plug into a machine and get the meaning out of it. Like they, they call for investment, insight, transformation in order to reveal their meaning. Um, let me give you one more example of Delphic Oracle, actually, because I think it's good. Like, uh, I think it's um, Croesus, I think, asks, uh, is that who it is? Goes to Delphic Oracle to find out if he should uh, go to war. And, and the Delphic Oracle says, yes, if you if you go to the war, a great empire will be destroyed. So he goes to war and thinking, OK, I got the go ahead. I'm going to wreck those guys. And it turns out his great empire is destroyed. Um, uh, so there was a an oracular utterance. That you know you could you could get the meaning of it wrong, right? And so the, the so the utterance didn't have the effect you thought it was going to have, right? So the, I'm just trying to bring out the sense of 
like were you was he deceived well sort of he heard something from which he took away the wrong meaning and that was his downfall and that downfall was what the oracle predicted um something about that riddlingness that ability for the meaning to the the potential for the meaning to be misapprehended seems to me that it might actually very well be integral to the way the god communicates um, Socrates himself says he learns from dreams and oracles and he doesn't mean by that that he believes in tarot cards you know he, he means but he means that um, he recognizes the presentation of compelling insights that don't just take the form of factually true statements about the world that you're familiar with um, anyway so once again so with so so with respect to their second law, would the God always be the same? Yeah, right. Does that mean, as they say, that the God would never appear in different forms? No. Should, if anything, it means the opposite. Um, would the God want to lie either in speech or deed by presenting an illusion? Well, in the sense that I was just saying, yeah. But they answer no. Um, and when I said yeah, I wasn't just making that up. Like I was trying to draw on the things we all would know from reading Socrates and thinking about the things he's talking about, right? And there's more stuff. There's more stuff in there, very interesting stuff. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm going to leave. Actually, one, one more last thing. He said, um, Socrates says, okay, would the God lie because of this? No. Would he lie because of that? No. Would he lie because he's frightened of his enemies? No. Um, is he, would he lie because of folly or the madness of his intimates? And Adamantus says, no, none of the foolish or the mad is a friend of the gods. Yeah, too bad again. Socrates is going to really go out of his way to emphasize that it's the mad who are the friends of the gods. Um, and, and indeed, the foolish means those who aren't wise. And Socrates kind of distinguishes himself from the wise. Uh, and uh, so, again, it makes it seem like the thing Adam Antis asserts is pretty much the opposite of what you'd expect from the thing Socrates asserts and shows. Uh, anyway... So he says, okay, so uh, do you then agree, I said. And, and once again, like when he talks like that, you can really see he he's not putting forward his view. He's saying, okay, have I, have I, I think I'm on board with what you're saying, right? Do you agree then that this will be the second model, the second law basically, the second model according to which speeches and poems about gods must be made. They aren't wizards who transform themselves, nor do they mislead by lies and speech or deed. And he says, I do agree. Yeah, too bad, you know, because uh, it seems like you missed the boat on that one. Yeah, Adamantus says, I am in complete agreement with these models and would use them as laws. So so we now see what Adamantus thinks as he's setting up his politeia, right? Socrates is working through those ideas with him, um, responding twice to his interruptions. This is his taking over the conversation Socrates was having with Glaucon about the guardians. And the conversation is about the thing that he had meant to said when he interrupted the earlier conversation Socrates was having, was having with Glaucon uh, that I read to you from the beginning of book two. So th that's where Ad Ad is going. And, and actually uh, when we get to, I think to the beginning of book four, we're going to see something else that, that Ad Mantis asserts about, about the guardians and so on that uh, will help to help to, make clear who this guy is that he's talking with and how his perception is shaking shaping things anyway that's as far as i want well that's as far as i want to get to in book two because that's the end of book two so i wanted to get us there um to complete our study of what's been happening in book two and and, and in what has now happened though is we've introduced this thing in the conversation with adamantus about looking at uh, the stories that the children are told and the impact they have on our upbringing and uh, what our values should be with respect to that. So now I want to go on next time by looking at um, some of the things that are said about that in book three, where they take up that issue uh, explicitly and in, and in considerable detail.